This is the Lydian Span with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. How you doing, Tim? I'm okay. I, I played a kind of like background. No, not even a background. I played like a straight ahead standards jazz gig on the double bass last night. It was a, a, a lot different from like, you know, concerts that we do, but uh, it got me out of the house. I got to play that thing a little bit. It was, it was a fun evening overall. Well, tonight I had a performance with, uh, or this week, having performances with Ian White of Big Sexy Noise, drums and vocals, uh, following a play about suicide at Les Creatives in Geneva. I wouldn't say where the light, where the light were lit, because it was rather brutal tonight. I can only imagine. It was absolutely quite fantastic. So that's what I'm doing. I'm culminating, coming close to the end of my six week long sojourn in Europe. It's been quite fantastic. And not only did, you know, uh, the war is never over win the jury prize in Barcelona last week, but we've just been nominated, I'm sure we won't win, for the International Documentary Music Award, which the Sparks, the Velvet Underground, Tina, as in Turner, and Summer of Soul are also nominated. For. Oh, wow. All of the other films are with Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, all of who rejected oh, me and Beth, we're used to it, doesn't matter. So that's uh, what's going on around here. Yeah, I saw Summer of Soul on the airplane. I don't know. It seems like a lot of hype. It is okay. It didn't, it didn't well, let's rock say my I'm more popular in Europe. If I won the Barcelona Jury Prize, I'm quite happy because I'll be hitting up all those museums I've already played at before. So, Tim, I have to ask you. Yes. Have you ever heard of uh, hogging? Have I heard, wait, have I heard of hogging? Is that what you asked? Have you heard of hogging? You're a I mean, college, you're well, an old that, college boy. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, sure. I, I, you know, hogging people, I mean, what hogging. Is hogging? A, a competition usually between a group of men that involves going to a bar frat house party. Participants go with the direct intention of hooking up with the fattest girl oh, oh, at oh, the God. party. Now, this is something that's <laughs> happening around some frat houses and it's causing quite a controversy i mean what's interesting is uh whatever the perversity uh you know there are chubby chasers and there are fat shamers um for neither of these but you know you, you won't find women going to find the fattest guy around just no that, 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 that's just, just I, you know fraternity brothers also do circle jerks you know they do all you know like, onto a cracker and then they fucking eat the last person to come eats it that kind well, of stuff. that's I mean, called you know that's just called being a dumbass frat boy. <laughs> They've got plenty of stupid activities they like to do to keep themselves amused. <laughs> However, this is causing a bit of a controversy because, well, you know, with uh, TikTok and all of this, it's just it's just happening. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't even know what to say. about. Well, that. it's funny. But I think that a group of I don't like to call them fat. We'll say I'd love to see a group of plump chicks just go and fucking kukaki, as I like to call it, a skinny boy. That would mean <laughs> 10 plump chicks coming all over their face. How about that? That? I, 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 that I'm sure that happens. Well, I mean, I, do you imagine that probably happens? Him. You're slender. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I think I'll pass. But um, Well, I'm going to try to see if I can get some gals to plump up for the holidays just in case the holiday mood hits you. Uh, yeah, I guess that would be calling calling. I guess we would call that plump up the volume. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do, and I mean, let's face it. Well, you gotta, you know, it's love, funny you gotta the, love the chunk. This <laughs> this reminded me. I, I had to do this really fucking shitty Greyhound bus trip from Chicago. I was visiting my dad, in Chicago, back to Massachusetts to my mom's. It was like an overnight thing. It was just real scummy, and. Some frat boy sat next to me right around uh, your old stomping grounds in upstate New York. And um, he was he was bragging about uh, some of their hogging adventures. I forgot all about that. Well, I mean, he, who he, does, that was a thing. Who does he think he's sitting next to? I mean, yeah, I just, I, well, I just, you know, the, it, one of my little social things that I do is um, if I if I'm ha if I'm hanging out with someone who I you know, kind of am nothing like I disagree on almost anything, but they're a little on the fringe of things I don't like. I just kind of give them a comfort without ever expressing what I'm really 
about or what I think. The real motives. And, and, and they, they kind of open up. So I really get more and more details. Well, you know <laughs> what? I always say open wide for Chunky because, you know, you talk to me about hogging. I might just shit on your fucking forehead, you stupid fuck. <laughs> well, you know, their hogging story was a little mean, I have to say. Or, or oh, this well, guy. that is the point. I, I, well, no, because I think they took it further. I, I think it was like some like really you know giant woman who maybe was a little insecure maybe she needed some but they did some kind of like gang bang and then and then they like i don't know what happened but they they convinced her like hey let's now like have fun and drive around in this car all naked and they're all naked in the car she was naked and then they like they kicked her out of the car naked um like in the downtown of like i don't know where it was say it loud i'm fat and i'm proud i mean i, I don't fucking no know I, in that anyway. it's not nice not nice. well no there are just a lot of not nice things frat, frat boys, frat boys are just, they just i don't even know how this came up but let me just say this i don't know if you've heard about these biblical storms that have been washing scorpions into egyptian streets I did, I did hear about this. Yes. Three people stung to death and over 500 injured. And I mean, right now there's been hail and thunderstorms. Stung to death. Ohio. Pardon me? Stung to death. Wow. Yes. So hail and thunderstorms along the, the river Nile swept the scorpions as well as snakes away from their usual hiding places in the city of Aswan. And, you know, Egypt is home to the fat tailed scorpions that are among the most deadly in the world and can kill humans in under an hour. I know you usually like the yeah. animal stories, but I'm beating you to the pinch. Okay. So anyway, schools have been ordered to close to protect children from the scorpions and snakes. And the professor of agricultural research center told the newspaper that heavy rains, well, it's responsible. So it's just another effect of, you know, climate change that now yeah. we have like, <laughs> we have like a plague of scorpions. Just just terrifying. Well, yes, uh, that's. I was I was watching this weird, and it's it's interesting because Elise Kasavan had given me these clips a while ago, and I finally last night with no internet, stuck in the mountains of nowhere, I decided to check it out, and it's called This Strange Rock. Have you heard about this show? Well, you wouldn't because Will Smith is the fucking uh, curator to it, but it's by Darren Aronofsky, and it's interesting because it talks just about all sorts of planetary things we might not know about. Like, well, I did not know that in Ethiopia, there's a sulfur desert. That's immense. I think I did know about that. That you cannot, I mean, you need a gas mask to go there, but the, the landscape itself is incredible because it almost looks like floral bacteria. So anyway, this strange rock is about, you know, various like underwater caverns in a circle in Mexico. Um, just all sorts of weird places that you know that are actually either poisonous or incredibly beautiful. And other than Will Smith, it's narrated by eight astronauts. I'm always interested in what Darren Aronofsky does. So that's what I amused myself with last night at around 5:30 in the morning when I couldn't get to sleep. Those underwater caverns, I mean, something about the minerals, they some of the most translucent water if you if you if you want to scuba dive it, it's like you're floating in air it's there's like such a beautiful scene with some guy in one of these underground caverns just floating up to the surface and it's really i have to say it's pretty magnificent and just again you know i'm one like you that we have to appreciate nature because it is there for the taking and i mean that, that's just i mean something they are trying to kill and they are succeeding in it but still, there's such an incredible amount of beauty. So, I mean, that's that's where we are, we're at. Hello, Greta Thornburg. Keep complaining. Andrew Bradshaw, mayor of Cambridge, Maryland, has been thrown in jail. He's the mayor uh, charged with 50 counts of revenge porn on his ex-girlfriend. Oh, heard about this. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, I mean, do you think he was going to get away with that? I mean, what, what and, and, and revenge porn is so pathetic. I mean, like, why would you do that? But you yeah. tell, is he a Republican? You know what? I didn't. It doesn't really fuck in Maryland. I, had, I have no idea, but um, maybe, maybe not. Um, the point is, he's a piece of shit. And <laughs> it doesn't um, matter what he claims but, to be. But he's, he's still he's still the mayor. I guess you get thrown in jail. You're, he's still he's kind of running the show in that town from his jail cell. Well, I'm waiting for a, a bunch of these. These indictments are coming down. I'd like to see a few of these motherfuckers thrown right in the pokey as soon as possible. Well, sure. Well, what about well, real big news this week is the Kyle Rittenhouse thing. Of course, I've been following. Oh. Some of those. 
those. Uh, I mean, who is politics. this fucking senile, asinine judge? And oh, how the fuck that is that judge? It's a piece of shit. Road. I mean, the, the, the courts are so stacked up. The judge is like, oh, and, and his phone ringer went off. He didn't mute it. And, and that crappy song, Proud to be American, was his, uh. is, is his ringtone. I mean, and, and the thing is, so so there's a twist in like Kyle Rittenhouse, like pick his jury out of a hat or something. I don't know what's going on. I mean, the- it, just, it just gets more facetious every day. Well, I mean, and speak about stupidity, this is how dumb America is anyway. So a new study has found that a significant percentage, I mean, and how smart can you be at four to seven years old, but four to seven year old children from the United States believe that hot dogs, hamburgers, and bacon come from plants. How, what's the percentage again? 40. Published yeah. in the Journal of Environmental Psychology, team of psychologists asked children to categorize a range of foods, including cheese, french fries, bacon, popcorn, shrimp, almonds, eggs. And the responses threw up a number of surprises, including that 47% of the participants believe that french fries came from animals. Whoa, does they have everything reversed? <laughs> I mean, well, another reason not to breed. What can I say? Oh, I go. mean, well, speaking of animals, and this is a little bit of a bummer. Um, turns out they're estimating 40% of deer in the United States have COVID because deer can get COVID. Oh. A- and and what's really upset, there's 30 fucking million deer, by the way. And those, and those things are, I don't know how to fan up deer. They, I mean, first they, Lyme they, disease spread by deer and now COVID. Well, what, well, what they're worried about is, because it's like, okay, I avoid a deer. But but it, basically, COVID, COVID is looking for another host as we are pushing it out. And they're going to just continue to mutate in this fucking deer. And, you know, deer, when you see them on the side of the highway, they'll come, they'll look at your car. You'll, they'll see you coming from a while. They'll just stare at you on the side. You're like, okay, I'm, it's on the side of the road. And then at the last second, they'll jump in front of your car. Like, what the fuck's wrong with those things? They really drive me nuts, actually. I'm not a fan of those fucking things at all. And um, I, I, I actually don't, I'm, I'm kind of psyched when people are hunting those things. I, I, I'm not a fan. All right. Well, you know, the killer instinct decide. You know, it was a happy Bambi ending or yeah. not so happy Bambi ending. And sure. uh, this is the Lydian spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl and one of my favorite badasses, Tom Hazelmeyer. Impresario of Amphetamine Reptile Records, graphic designer, promoter, booking agent, bar owner. I don't even know what to call this guy except for just a weirdo of the highest order. I'm very happy to have him on the show of the Lydian Spin. Welcome, Tom Islamire. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and I'd have to say one of my favorite badasses, Tom Hazelmeyer. How do I even begin to describe you, my friend? Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. Teenage badass. Joins the Marines to piss people off, and we'll get into that in a minute. Starts one of the most, first of all, re- Halo of Flies, one of the most obnoxious and devastating musical uh, troops ever. And one of the most devastating recordings I ever did, thank you for asking me. Amphetamine Reptile, recording, releasing Melvin's cows, unsane, the list goes on. Graphic designer of the frickin' highest order. Toy maker. What am I? Oh, club owner. Restauranteer. <laughs> Restauranteer and survivor of, of a month-long coma. Christ. It's, it's, it's ADD. It's just a lot of ADB. I have to say, welcome, Tom Hazelmeyer. I'm so glad to have you on here. And let's just go back in time a little bit. There's so much to cover. What did you learn in the Marines? You know, as a one woman army, I'm always curious about shit like that. So much on how not to do shit. <laughs> okay. One of, one of those early lessons I figured out in life that has been massively beneficial and no college will teach you, which is watch those that are fucking up, learn from it. I think one of the biggest things, the biggest takeaways aside from just the, uh, the skill set, is uh, how to get along with every walk of life. You're stuck literally in a barracks or a room with some redneck from Texas and some inner city kid from Southside Chicago, et cetera, et cetera, constantly. So you just kind of, it was like a great lesson in that. Between the inner city youth and the Texas 
redneck. That's what it feels like to live inside my body. So I understand. <laughs> did you did you struggle with uh, general tolerance of, of the general public before you went to the Marines? You, I mean, you said this is a lesson you learned before that where you just kind of in your own world and you kind of got basically uh, as a teen, like doing the whole hardcore thing in, in Minneapolis, you know, whenever you're in a music or art bubble, it's a bubble, you know, you pick and choose who you're friends with. You generally are all aligned in some sort of idealism or some sort of, you know, thought or thing of the moment. The only experience you had with, uh, you know, rednecks was South Minneapolis throwing bottles at you screaming punk rock fat. You know, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't like we had to break bread and sit down and deal with each other. So it was kind of breaking out of that. I would say what, what years were you serving? 83 to 87. So did you, let me think about this. Did you have to deal with uh, Libya? I, 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 I missed you, everything. You did. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, that was, that was all the thing was like, I, I, you know, jokingly, but it wasn't a joke at the time. It's like in the punk rock circles of the time, everyone was just like, that's it. Reagan. We're going to war. We're going to war. Right, and I was like, right. well, if we're going to go to war, I want front seat. Nice. Who okay. goes up front seat? The Marines. So I'm joining the Marine Corps. So not, not and then I missed. And there was like wow. everything. Wow. So you skated, you skated out of that. That's interesting. It's, it's funny because my cousin had a, has a similar story who might be a similar age. I don't know your age, but he was in high school and he was partying and doing it, you know, with all his buddies. And I don't know why you signed up, but at least this is his story. I'm wondering if it's similar where he just signed himself up and, you know, he came from like a Chicago kind of Democratic Party, somewhat liberal thing. And, and basically like, what the fuck are you doing? And now he's a successful businessman. But he, he it was like a self-discipline thing that he superimposed on himself. And it really just changed the trajectory of his life completely. It was kind of insane. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a good dose of that. You know, it's a valuable skill in life to show up on fucking time, which, you know, uh, everyone here is, is isn't been involved with the arts one way or another for lifetimes. It's not a skill a lot of people seem to fucking have. <laughs> well, I tend to put the punch in punctual. I like to be on time. I'm usually 30 years ahead of my time, but I like to be on time. We both have a lot of discipline because we have to in order. I mean, we're kind of both professional jugglers, Mr. Hazelmeyer, in the sense that it's not just one thing that's going to satisfy our creative needs we have to do a lot of different things and we have to organize a lot of different people and, and projects that is one thing i completely respect about you how much you've managed to get done in your life and you have to i don't think you're stopping well are you stopping what about covid what, what happened what happened what happened actually here? covid was awesome because i got to uh have full run of the pressing plants ah, like every, everyone decided to shut down and, and hibernate so we cranked up the schedule we tripled the schedule every other label was shutting down i'm like are you fucking kidding me you've got a captive audience where you do mail order you know everyone's sitting at fucking home with their finger up their ass with nothing to fucking do so uh, a lot of it was with buzz who i know you've done a, uh, you've had buzz on the show of the melvins yeah and so he was cranking stuff out and then nothing but time to do art they you know the bars were shut down by the government for nine plus months but your bars manage to stay alive yeah by the by the skin of my teeth most of the people i know actually succeeded in covid even either by collecting money or by actually getting shit done i was lucky because i didn't have any touring coming up anyway and i was working on other projects so that was fine but so grumpy's by the way grumpy's original design of the old these are chomping on perhaps the cigars. One of my favorite designs you've ever done. I love the grumpies. I love those bar stools. I loved all of that. And so pump up the volume. There you go. It, COVID worked for some people. Yeah, I'd say that uh, I don't know how it's working for you guys, but like a year and a half into it, now I'm starting to notice some of the downside, which is like I enjoyed isolation way too much. Ah. It's like, you know, I, I didn't miss the live setting. I, it's like, you know, you get to that point and also the farmer hours like i started waking up at six fucking o'clock in the morning whoa are you now are you naturally an early bird no i mean i'm i'm i'm, a, I'm not much of a sleeper but uh we share that it was not six o'clock <laughs> you know and now it's like sitting there with drinking the coffee waiting for the sunrise every fucking morning so now. but so is it you got used to isolation was it the um is it just this purgatory kind of zone that we're in that's not it's we're not a hundred percent we're at 50 or 60 well, I mean, percent on one level i was pushing it where i was just like the second we could get out and go i was out and about like traveling 
you know, driving to Green Bay, Wisconsin for something to fucking do, going to Duluth, right. you know, when that, when, when you could, or when, when the situation presented itself, uh, down to Chicago, a bunch of visit my daughter down there just to get out. So I wasn't like I, you know, nestled in and <laughs> shut the doors down. I didn't, you know, a lot of this, the whole thing, I didn't quite fucking understand anyhow. The extreme. Yeah, you know, when it, when it first happened, how I described it is it felt like when you were an adolescent, not quite a teenager, and you were just waiting for something to fucking happen and like, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? That's how it felt in the beginning. And then I started thinking, you know, what about when people used to actually go off to war for years? And I mean, I really had that kind of mindset, like, what about when, you know, your your lover, your husband, what, you know, it wasn't often women because we we're too smart to go to fucking war. We have the war internal that we fight every month. And I was like, the, the people used to go off to war and not come back for a long time. And also, you know, I just I'll think back. people that had a big problem. Yeah, people, people that had a big problem is because, yeah, well, they had the internet so they could, you know, be stupid all fucking day long. But I think most people just can't stand to be alone with themselves and sit quietly to contemplate what a fucking asshole or what they haven't accomplished yet. <laughs> And I came to terms with my assholeness a long time ago. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, yeah, it's, uh, the fear factor was incredible watching that because I didn't have it. I, you know, it's not like I have a death wish by any stretch, but at the same time, it's like, you're going to fucking die. Who cares? I, you know, the numbers are out there. It's like, I, I'm, I was definitely in the high risk category. I already went through it. I did it this spring. I, I had, you know, severe COVID for a month was on my oh, ass. God. But, it is what it is. So it's like, you know, I'm not going to hide the rest of my fucking life. And I know people have been hiding for two fucking years. You're just like, well, I mean, you know, you as somebody who can, <laughs> I wanted to say fart in the face of death. I don't know why, but I mean, your experience that you already had being in a, a coma meningitis for a month was, I mean, that kind of prepares you for the next horrible possibility. I mean, I think everybody should face death as soon as possible by whatever means necessary, because it is inevitable. Also, if you've wrapped your head around, like, you know, being a complete atheist your entire life, what's the fucking be scared of? The suffering, sure, I don't want to be a quadriplegic living, you know, being fed through a straw for the next, you know, 10 years. That would suck, but just fucking biting it. Do you lose your sense of smell and taste? Do you have any uh, lingering after effects or symptoms? I'm such a fucking mess. I wouldn't know. I mean, the, the, I didn't lose, didn't lose the uh, sense of smell, but I've already, you know, I'm a couple heart attacks into it, and uh, oh boy, all sorts of other shit, you know. Wow. So you, so you, you're lucky. Well, no, no, maybe, no it's maybe, gonna take maybe. more than it's gonna take more than COVID <laughs> to take Hazel by around. Come on, come on. Figured you had, had to had to had to have it, but so uh, what about what in terms of going back to like keeping a business going and and uh, you know that restaurants are struggling to, to have them. Imp- employees i mean people are, are are it's hard to get people to work it seems like a lot so are, are you uh oh that's definitely been a battle i mean and i understand it too because it's like if you're giving out the kind of money they were giving out you'd be a fucking idiot not to take it you know and, and, and to avoid a job you don't fucking want or right. like i'm not going to slight anyone that right service industry is hard I mean, if people who are waiting on other people as they get drunk and eat too much, that's that's a hard job. Serving drinks is not as easy as it sounds. Oh, God, so. no. You get to see the worst of everyone all the time. Yeah, so, I mean, it, that, that's that not been been easy, but it is it is what it is. I mean, I think we're, we're just on the toboggan slide. When you were talking about being a teenager, waiting for shit to happen, yeah. <laughs> it's starting. We're, you know, the... the the yep. snowball is starting to roll down the hill. We're You're talking about the, the, the tech revolution. I'm talking about uh, everything. I'm uh, talking uh, about the, the real estate like, bubble, the Wall oh, Street yeah, bubble, oh, yeah. the, you know, the COVID destruction we've not even admitted to. Like well, the, it, 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 the economy. I mean, we're just going down, you know, a lot peak of stuff corruption, was, peak true, fucking. Totally. And a lot of stuff was highlighted during this. I mean, <laughs> it, well, the weird like, thing is, it's like I was amazed at how well they were able to kind of downplay it all. Like everyone's just in the thing of like you know, oh, it was just a little blip you're like i don't know maybe not it's gonna, it's gonna you know, be right, right, right be before i left right before i left for europe in, in october you know uh the two countries i was going to first went into the red zone two days before i got there in austria and slovenia austria is now just locking everybody down who's not vaccinated i mean i think if there could have been a better plan 
globally to just go, all right, everybody stay home for a freaking month and let it blow over. But there was just no organization about this. And, you know, we had, you know, grand bullshitters mismanaging everything. And I'm not sure it's even managed now. So. And on one hand, too, it's like you can't this there's this weird thing going on that we can manage it. Like, yeah, exactly. I've never been able to yeah. manage it so far in history. All of a sudden, magically, now we can control a virus. I, I'm not buying that shit for a second. And I'm, you also, know, I mean, I'm I, also no fan of, you know, there's a lot of this narrative that's getting pushed around by corporate death fuckers like Pfizer that, that strangely no one's questioning. But well, well, yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> we can go further. I mean, yeah, I don't no, no, no. The whole no, world, they, you know. Opiate epidemic, opiate epidemic, all that stuff. But why don't we go back? Okay, so um, yeah, let's get into our. Let's, 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 go, let's go to uh, so your Marines, and then and then after Marines, uh, Halo flies uh, basically start. Well, Halo, Halo flies was was during the Marines. During uh, the Marines, okay. If any reptile got started when I was in the Marine Corps, it was like you know we're doing going. I'd go home and we'd record. And I was hitting up all my favorite labels like uh, Homestead and Touch and Go and Discord. Nobody wanted it. To... What's that? Nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. They're just like, <laughs> know the feeling. <laughs> so I was like, well, fuck you. I'll do it myself. And uh, that's right. how that was the birth of Infinity Reptile was uh, through by that. And then when, I, when I'm doing it, then friends like the guys that were in the U Men or are, are, uh, the Mud Honey guys at the at that point they were they were called the Throne Ups would come to me and like, Hey, can you do this record? And you're like, why the fuck you need me? It's really easy. You just, you know, <laughs> it took me years to realize that it's not that easy. It's easy for me, but the average band can't seem to pull their shit together to get it done. Um, so it's well, like, it is a skill, yeah. you know? Well, thank you for, thank you for pulling so much together for so many people because you really fucking did. I mean, were you always like doing illustrations as a kid? Were you, I mean, your illustrations are so fantastic. I really love them. Oh, they're they're so, so much. bold. I mean, they really, I'm, I'm so thrilled about them. And you did so many covers, so many T-shirts. I love the Zippos. I love the Japanese dolls. Were, were you, did you start doodling as a kid? I mean, it was like that, that thing they would say about art school. I never went, but when they, you know, you're the kid who is the best. You could draw the best in class and then you get to art school and it's like there's a whole shitload of kids out there who can draw way the fuck better than you. It was kind of, you know, I was always that kid in the small you know whatever setting but i kind of i walked away from it and got into design like doing flyers and stuff for for bands that i was in in the you know late 70s early 80s kind of thing and and that's where i cut my teeth and i've always been more into graphics the doing the actual physical art myself didn't come about until the past like 10 12 years who were some of your art or illustration or comic influences as a as a kid as a teenager yeah, in, in your you know until your twenties, like who who were you looking at that you're like I'm gonna fucking do that too? Oh man, it's, it, it's always been something. I mean that that's always been a heavy heavy stimulus for me. It's funny I ran across the old copy of Hustler. I hadn't looked oh, at it since I was a kid. You know? it, it was like you know back in the seventies, if you got one of those as a kid, you were you were set for you know masturbating for months. But you know you're just like, but I got I saw this old copy and I picked it up and I'm pawing through it and I'm like it never had dawned on me how massively influential that magazine was on me graphically, like all the early graphics I was doing. I'm going through it. I'm like, holy shit. Like this stuff had completely permeated my being. I had no idea. So I'm, you know, decades later looking at the magazine and going, oh man, the way they use type and the photography and you know, just the whole nine yards, which then later on to find out how many geniuses work there that couldn't get jobs elsewhere like uh, Buzz's wife, Mackie, who's a great designer, you know, cut her, cut her teeth working at Hustler. I was always impressed that Larry Flint was paying for the hypocrisy of sexual perverts lies. And I just thought, you know, uh, look, they had, he had something going for him. Oh, no, but the graphics, just that alone was cutting Absolute. edge. Uh, other stuff back then, too, it's like a, a big, big, huge thing for me graphically was, was the whole punk rock thing. The Teenage Jesus 12 inch cover. I mean, that that's one of those, you know, bah! I remember seeing that on the wall as a kid at the record store as a teenager and just like, you know, bah! it was one of the, you know, top 10 moments of seeing grab, you know, Jamie Reed with the pistols, all that kind of stuff, huge influence. The comic book thing since I was a kid, like Jack yeah. Kirby, 
all that whole uh, uh, part of it, which is like now like American mythos, you know, but there's always the cheesy, shitty end of, of shit that wasn't art that got me off. I loved that stuff from Big Daddy Roth to it was Absolutely. never, yeah. you know, you go down the, the, the line on that type of stuff. You know, later on uh, exposing myself or educating myself on, on fine arts, I still find most of it to be a fucking drag just like <laughs> ditto thank you, know, you. conceptually I, you can't you know it doesn't work it, that, that just you know i what the fuck is wrong with visceral <laughs> i don't nothing yeah the analogy i've always used is like can you imagine if john cage had been in charge of rock and roll how oh, that would just like <laughs> it would suck it would have been overthought, no gut reaction, no, you know. I mean, John Cage is kind of, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, not taking it's not, anything it's not, from John no, Cage. No, 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 no I know. Saying, I, it's not clear he even likes music, which is kind of funny, too. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, I, I mean, I, I have something in common with John Cage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. They're really, they're really, you know, I, it's always, I always love it when I run into someone who claims they don't like music. I, I'm actually kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of curious about that. Like, wow, because because most people say, "Oh, I love music," and and then they're like, "Hey, turn it down." Like, you know, most people are actually lying about it. But so it's always refreshing if someone's honest. Like, I don't like music. Well, <laughs> there's awesome. there's more to not like than there is to like. The same with well, that's all. That's a, that's what isn't that way in life. That's the same with everything. But uh, I remember seeing John Cage at a uh, performance when I was a teenager. That's definitely where I, you know, wanted to go down towards the visceral because it was just like somebody, you know, my, my, my best friend at the time was just giving me this descriptor, you know, description of, of who John Cage is. And I'm like, that sounds fucking amazing. That sounds really cool. Like, you know, like three minutes and 33 and, and all that kind of stuff. And then when you get there and you're actually facing it, you're just like, <laughs> no. Yeah, but Tom, I, I love the uh, music avant-garde, but I don't love John Cage. I mean, there, there's obviously there's quite a bit of uh, variety within that world. And of course, he was. Well, go, to go back to it. Lydia, it was within the same month he performed at the same place Eight Eyed Spied played, which was the uh, Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis that's attached to the sure. our, our MoMA, Walk the Walker. Uh, oh, yeah, did we, did we shit on the stage? No, but I was I was front and center. I got the front row. It was funny. It was in a typical Minnesota fashion when nobody wanted the front row. So even though we got there late, I'm like, fuck, I'll take it. Nobody probably I was, I wasn't wanted born in this to be there. Place. I'm, I'm from Michigan. We're different, <laughs> different mindset. Did you did you have any run ins with Prince uh, over your years in uh, Minneapolis? One. You have one. one. Okay. <laughs> I was home on leave. I'm sitting in a record store uh, with my brother. And he goes, hey, this is your chance if you ever want to pop that fucking piece of shit or cocksucker or whatever he <laughs> what? said. And I'm like, Wait, what? what? And I turned to my, my brother's on my left. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I turned to my right and there's this fucking midget. And I mean, right. he was five, not even five foot. Now, you know, he he's five wee one, little, I think. Right. Anyhow, wee yeah. little man. Wee, yeah, yeah. And, but behind him were two fucking just huge 500 bodies, pound yeah. gorillas yeah, yeah. that were looking at me like, do it, make a fucking move, do it. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm on my prime. I'm like a 20 year old Marine just going, Dude, shut the fuck up! <laughs> I don't feel like getting my ass kicked. I, that was my I, only my only interaction with Prince. So I, I don't think you had anything to prove at that point. So when did you decide? You know, okay, now you're making music, you're doing graphics, then you start promoting shows. I mean, was that when you got a club, or were you promoting shows before because you had to? Um, there was, I mean, through the years of doing the record label, there's the, the years of, of setting up all the kind of new music seminar. I'm sure you know all, you know, that whole shtick and CMJ and South by South. Like AMREP was one of the first labels to help South by Southwest out and, you know, uh, bend over backwards to get them, you know, great shows and stuff at a point in time where they couldn't get fucking arrested because they're in the middle of nowhere. Well, we understand that we're in the middle of fucking nowhere. We love you guys. You're us. We're you. They were at one point. At one point. Then fast forward 20 years later when there was oh, a documentary sorry. about amphetamine reptile and they wouldn't even screen it. You're just like, oh, that's right. No collective memory longer than three oh minutes. Well, they, they were supposed sponsorship, to sponsorship, et cetera. They were supposed to screen my documentary, The War Is Never Over. And I was praying it would be canceled South oh, by yeah. Southwest right before COVID. And it was because I hate them so fucking much at this point. I mean, I was there maybe 10, 15 years ago. I hated them then. I just thought they were corporate cocksuckers. No, it'd be fun. The only way to participate for the past 10 years or better was to, to do something outside of it down there because you got so many friends and stuff yeah. that it can be a good event and great. Just don't involve yourself with the cocksuckery. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a proper it's, terminology. It's uncomfortable. It. I, 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 uh, I, if I'm going to do, do, do any cock sucking, it's going to be on my own fucking terms. Let's just get that straight right now, Hazel. Okay? Brought to you by Coca Cola. Right now. <laughs> but, maybe, Gabby, maybe brought you by Coke Cola. You're so right. When did you start booking me? That was through Peter, wasn't it? Peter Davis? I don't know, because, you know, I was never that popular in Minneapolis nor anywhere, actually, but so be it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I've always been, a, uh, I've told you this before, just massive, you know, massive fan since teenage days, 79, 80, you know, Queen of I Am, still one of my favorite fucking records ever. Thank you so much. So when Peter was working with you to book in some of those tours, I think we got you into the uh, the side room, the venue at the club that we would do like Billy Childish and, and uh, art shows and kind of got to be known as like a nice room for underground kind of things that was out of the, out of the norm too. Cause it's like getting the fuck out of the punk rock club is also, as you know, so much better than venue to see something just to get your headset out uh, of that dank black painted, everything sticky, uh, shitty, you know, room. Look, I always love doing the spoken word at Grumpy's, you know, the side room there at the, at Grumpy's. I think that's my ideal situation to perform. We uh, literally built the stage in that room for you, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Because I didn't want to be compared to the midget prince because I'm a little taller than five feet one. My brother would have walked in and said, Daryl's your chance to hit that son of a bitch. <laughs> he was also the one, too. I was, I was talking this. He, he's. He, he passed away recently, but uh, we were, I was talking with Kurt Cobain at the height of Cobain's thing. He was in Minneapolis recording and my little brother's walking by. I said, come here, Tim. I said, Tim, Tim this is a uh, Kurt. He's like, yeah, I turned and walked off. <laughs> it was like amazing. He's like, yeah, whatever. Okay. And just walked away. I was like, when I was like, yeah. He also still did one of my favorite moves ever in a bar. Me and a friend are off talking and he's getting into an argument with two guys playing pool. And he had a, uh, and they're like, that's it. We're taking you outside, motherfucker. You're cheating, blah, blah, blah. My brother could cheat at pool. He wasn't that fucking good. And he had a flannel shirt on and he had the pool cue. And he just pulled the shirt back and they saw the 357 on his belt. And then he took his shot. And I was just sitting there and just busted out laughing. And they both just put their cues down and walked off. It was just like, <laughs> yeah, yes. It was like, dude, that was the coolest thing I've ever fucking seen. Didn't say a word, didn't say nothing threatening, just took a shot. I took a shot, man. Hey, would you say the 357 is one of your favorite pieces of well designed equipment? Uh, yeah, definitely. For, for a wheel gun. Oh, I, I, no. I like a, a, if, for a semi auto, I'm going with the 45. It's gun talk. Gun talk with Lily. Well, well look, let, let's go back. You should away. have seen her when she got into my gun safe. Okay, well, that's I'm going to talk about that right well, I, you now. Know, I, Lydia I brags left... about, she brags about her sniper uh, precision. I, I, hey, I, hey, I, I, I never, think... never, never go to the range with Lydia. I'd like to see it actually in action. Well, you're we didn't, we didn't get to go to the range. She just got into the gun safe. She's like, well, you have guns and well, can I check them out? And I'm like, wow, I've got a whole safe full of them. And it's like, well, well, let's just, safe. let's just, like, let's look. Kid in the candy I, store. Well, not only that, but I photographed your guns and I photographed your daughter who was maybe six or seven at the time. And then I made a montage called Ghost Girl, which is one of, still one of my favorites. So, uh, you know, I see a gun, I gotta use it one way or another in the right way, of course. Oh, just <laughs> saying, I probably left a wet spot. So when did uh, Halo Flies finally just end it? Um, I, We were touring and uh, there was like a big, before the whole festival thing started, one of the one of the ideas it had was to uh, put five or six bands, AMRAP, various AMRAP bands on a bus because they had like, you know, those buses that sleep 16. It's like, well, fuck it. We can take turns <laughs> and uh, hit a bunch of cities in Europe, which was uh, God, that was fucking fun. But uh, we, were, we were one of the bands. What's that? What, this is what 90. It was either 90 or 90. I think it was 90. Okay. It was in the 80s. Who, who was on that bus? Helmet, God Bullies, Tar out of Chicago, Halo Flies, and Surgery. Mm. New York. Brutal Bill. Those guys were fucking... <laughs> Surgery were always the ones... Yeah, they, that was the trouble. The troublemakers amongst a fucking whole gaggle of troublemakers. Mm. 
but it was we were putting the tour together and like this uh this guy's like we can't work it out financially and i'm like well why not he's like well you know with all the roadies i'm like we got a bus with like 25 fucking young men we don't need fucking roadies we'll get the shit in we'll get it out you know it's like well then we have all everyone's stage gear i'm like we'll share so we have to pull this all together and and but anyhow at the end of the tour it was just this weird thing where i was just splitting the constantly splitting attentions between the label and the band um like one of the things that the, you know the band guys didn't dig was that i was like we're opening every show because i got shit to do i gotta work the merch thing i gotta take care of this and do that other stuff plus i can get fucking wasted then um and those you know and that way too no one can argue with me what the lineup is that night you know mm. no one can bitch about well look it's like fuck you i took the opening slot you're playing third you're playing second right 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 um, right but anyhow, I, love to, of- I love to play first. I love to play first. I yeah. love to play. I'll play at 9 a.m. I prefer that hour, actually. I've di- You saw Buzz do that. He, that's his tradition whenever we do the shows here in Minneapolis, because it's like that way we get everyone at the show right away is have the Melvin yeah. opening the bill. And he's he's like, fuck yeah, then my day's done at two o'clock. I'm, yeah. like, I'm out. Right. And and right. uh, but at the end of that tour, it was just like weird. Like this. I feel like a fucking cover band. Let's quit in, in London. That's when we quit. And just because you're doing the same songs all the time, and that was a drag. Yeah, for you? It just it was just um, uh, it was just weird. It was not meant to be. What year did you pull me into your shed to do that single? That was uh, is that 2000, 2006 or seven? I don't know. We you'd been to you'd been to Minneapolis. We'd done like some shows and stuff together prior to that, but that was uh. That's still one of the most brutal recordings I've ever been involved in. I mean, not the act of recording it, because that was pretty fucking easy on my part, but it's still one of the most harsh, sexy, filthy. Well, I loved it, too, because, yeah, you just came in and fucking nailed it. I mean, you had a copy of it, but it was, it was, uh, that was awesome. No, and that was the the peak of the back room. I always call it <laughs> behind the bar studios, because it's the office behind the bar. We're just running everything through the, through the computer. But there would be some weird shit going on. People screaming and people walking by <laughs> to the bar, like, "What the fuck? Is someone getting killed back there?" But no, it's well, that, just vocals. That that well, but actually, that single sounds like murder to me. Well, then we we nailed it. It's a rarity. We nailed it. Hey, a, hello, we did it. We we nailed it. What can I say? So, how do you feel about the bars reopening? I mean, are you tired? Are you done with that, or do you have to do that? Is that part of what you know? keeps you afloat with all your other projects or is it just mandatory that somebody's got to have a cool bar in minneapolis yeah it's that no it's a, uh, uh, it's kind of the day job um i mean we both know how well certain aspects of of, of the arts will pay yeah exactly <laughs> i mean you could do That's an art show once a week and not make a living um and then and at best you can usually set up like you know, one or two a year if you're yeah. just you know, strictly strictly like you know art or that's you know, why we, that's music why or spoken word or go down the list sorry, sorry we're jugglers we are you, so are you a, you're, you're like a, a busy body it sounds like though you you like to keep yourself occupied or am i wrong um no but at the same time i have no problems about sitting on the couch watching worthless fucking tv for six hours <laughs> Yeah. Tom, we are so much alike that I'm I we might be the same person. I, I don't know. All right. So okay, if you're gonna binge, what was the latest thing or what's what, what are you binging on? Gotta know. For for the for the uh sitting on your ass time, which is rare, but when you're sitting on your ass, what do you want to binge? Man, I am drawing a fucking blank and I, I'm always binging something. What was the I, last thing? Fuck, I'm I it's like brr. Well, maybe you just want to keep that to yourself. I see a little bit of mystery goes a long way. Now. You, you see, a I'm year a fl- straight of nothing but like fucking midget porn. Just it's a, it's oh, just a, it's erased some of the, the capacities, but don't worry about it. I'm a forensic freak. I need to know every, you know, and the, the problem is knowing all about forensics makes you realize it does. Well, I've always employed other people to commit my crimes. That's why I'm a little bit smarter. But you've the got the whole asshole. Oh, you're addicted to the crime shows because that—that's the hotel fodder. Like it literally goes to A and E or one of the channels that has. Yeah, no, but I, yeah, shows. no, but I did. I only true crime. I'm not into like recreations. I'm into the true facts. I need to know how to avoid detection. I need to know 
uh, how many, uh, I, I actually, I just recently got into the new Unsolved Mysteries because Tyler Hubby, who we had on the show, said he was editing some of them. I never liked the original ones, but I like when a crime is solved, but I want to, and one of my favorite things, I've talked about this before, Bowser from Shauna Nav, this I found out <laughs> from Forensic Files, became what's like a forensic linguistic. He had read so many contracts that he became an expert in decoding whether if you wrote a suicide letter, did you really write that letter or did somebody else? And he he was able to decode it by the patterns of speech. Now I'm like, I miss my fucking calling here. Thing is, nobody decodes my patterns of speech. It's always straight over the fucking head. Maybe I need to call Bowser in and he could be my translator. I don't know. I think one of the keys from watching the TV shows though is like the, the first 48 where they, they follow two cases and different. Oh yeah. That's the key good. is to wanting to pull off the perfect murder is to pick the fucking city because the police departments in let's say a Memphis are utterly fucking worthless. Lure your victim to a Memphis or a New Orleans. Right now in America, there could be anywhere between 3,000 and 4,000. How is that fucking divide so wide? Serial killers active right now. There's 91,000 missing people in America as we speak. I'm just amazed. I mean, this gives me endless uh, fodder. I don't even have to turn the fucking TV on. I'm just, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, think, think, think about how fucking skewed that number is when, let's say, how, let's say somebody decides to go after the undocumented. Hello. Yeah. That now there's going to be thousands that would, they're not even registered, so they well, can't be reported. Any statistic or number, and I do love numbers, they turn me on, but just because you would think a number is finite, but who makes these statistics? So you can't trust it. You're going to use it as a reference point. Go, well, if they say there's three to 4,000, maybe there's 7 to 8,000, or maybe there's 300 to 4,000. Who the fuck? The thing is, it's just still astronomical. I never had a hit record. I never put a hit on anybody. Let's just say I'm keeping it at that. That's, that's my... Uh, my That's head's my still favorite. spinning about Bowser from Sean on I. <laughs> ah, well, what can Doing I say? Doing anything productive. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, I mean, that, that, that Sean and I started at Columbia University. I mean, they're not idiots. I mean, they did. They are like what, doing the whole doo-wop. Did you ever sit thing. through? You're, are you old enough to have sat through that fucking TV show? I, I, I was about five. <laughs> you know, I would watch it because I nothing. You know, you have a five-year-old on, on TV. Yeah. It was just on. And uh, and then there was like a public service announcement that Bowser did about um girls can do anything boys can do uh, uh yeah, yeah we can look that one up you know you know i, I i'm kind of getting a crush here and i you know me i don't like men my own age or older but i'm kind of i have to well i have to get bowser on the podcast i'm not sure about that maybe he could do a forensic you know, examination of one of my speeches although bowser right. the guy who played bowser, bowser is actually jewish uh you know he plays like he's kind of andrew dice clay before andrew dice clay uh, my mine is the profanity, but he still does here. I'm in Bensonhurst. He'll he'll still do these kind of like parade things as if he's uh, like an Italian greaser. It's uh, like, like Tim, yeah, 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 Tim, <laughs> you got a job to do, and that's get me get me okay. a meeting. Okay. All right, back to Tom Hazelmeyer. I mean, God, I mean, he's who's no mind Bowser. Is, his mind has been blown out by midget. He, not really. He doesn't remember what he's been binge watching, which means he's got to binge some more. He's still creating an unbelievable amount of work because he's a maniac. So what is some of your favorite art, you know, that you've, I mean, you've done so much though. I mean, do you, is there any band that you're like, oh yeah, I want to do more. You've done so much with the Melvins, Unsane, Cows, et cetera. I mean, obviously these are your friends. You continue to work with them. I'm, I'm pretty stoked just to, to continue with Buzz because it's like we're, we're, uh, I mean, we've known each other since we were damn near kids and uh same background you know what were the families we came from uh upbringing the moments we got into what kind of music and all that type of stuff so it's like we're pretty pretty uh, two peas in a pod well and, i have to uh, think there's maybe there's two differences uh you don't wear frocks in yeah public, in public that and you know of in public as i said and if you don't golf do you i'm not a golfer well, yeah. again, again, we're so similar, Tom, because I had to call Buzz up on that. I'm like, golfing, golfing, fishing is better than golfing. But here's the thing I, you don't understand. He's gotten so good, he's become a ringer at the golf courses in L.A. Does he All hustle? The, the, Does he, is he like a hustler? Is he? he? He has the other one. Everyone else has to put up the money. But 
all these guys that are really good and they get into these things, they want him because he looks like Buzz. Right. And the other golfers have no idea who the fuck he is. They're like, who could, who's this fucking guy? And then well, he just fucking kills them. And it's just like... I have newfound, newfound respect for the art of his con. You guys probably really connect. You guys really connect because it seems like the rate at which you guys produce stuff is kind of parallel and you can keep up with each other. And it's also a thing, too, where it's just like we, the, the trust is implicit both ways, where it's like he just throws shit and goes to go. I don't have to handhold and right, right, is it, right, can right. I get away with this? Can I do that? Or can we do this? It's just like, you know. So t shirts, album covers, wood cuts. Anything else you want to do? I mean, again, I'm going back to those bar stools with the grumpy logo, which I love so much. Any other objects outside of strictly music that you have interest in next conquering? Um, I've I've I've, I've literally been toying with the whole the comic book thing just because I it's always I've been a fan my entire life. Yeah, um, and it's like it's gone. It's hilarious how the the downtrodden bastard child of pop culture has literally taken over pop culture there's like two-thirds of all movies are based on a comic book you know people don't know unbelievable yeah unbelievable like the best and brightest went there you know for a long time and there's the quality of stuff it's kind of in you know but you start getting to the point too where you realize like you know how how do you compete with somebody who's been doing that for 40 years you know well, but that doesn't usually stop yeah. me from no, 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 exactly exposing my my uh, <laughs> myself in, in that realm. You know, I, I did a I did a few comic books. I mean, I did one with Ted McKeever. He was amazing. Called Toxic Gumbo. One with Bob Fingerman, and uh, one with this guy Mike Matthews with some plays that I wrote with Nick Cave called Asphyxiate. And that artist who was great. He was kind of like a young uh, Robert Williams actually was that style and uh, he thought witches were after him and the next thing you know he was found floating in the Thames unsolved mystery but so it's another thing we have in common just in case you need a female character to base comic on as somebody that's been called walking pornography thank you Mike Girard for telling calling me the best thing I've ever been called um I'm here. Were, were, you, how, how, were you like back back in the day in, in New York or where because it was like that that the comic underground comic scene at that same time as the whole like you know no wave and CB scene like Kaz and and Burns and and was Pant. I know oh, I love Char- I love Charles Burns. I love his art. And, I, I mean, but that, that was like thriving at the same time. I like how no one ever like connected the dots. You know. Yeah. But like I, it, I don't you know. I don't know where Charles Burns was out of though. I don't think he was out of New York. I know he bounces. He's moved around. Same with uh, uh, Panther, who's like, an, I know he's a Texan originally, but I think right. he's also also amazing. I mean, all those guys, I mean, you know, from the comic art to then the lowbrow, the rise of, of lowbrow. I mean, it was just, you know, a fantastic time anyway. And most of these people are like us still fucking going. But not to digress, which uh, Borden's record or records did you put out? No, I only I only did uh, like they were on a compilation that. I, ah, that OK. Out. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that one stood, that one stood out. I was like, boredom. You put them. All right. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a little story about the Unsane for a minute because I know you did a lot of work with them too. And Pete Shore, who shares my birthday, June second. Pete you. Shore. Pete Shore had to be my blood boy when I did a play south of your border, where the last scene I'm crucified on a giant black rubber cross naked, and Pete Shore had to come and put blood hoses under my wig. And he would shake, let tremble like a little girl. And it, but beside, the theater was freezing. Like he would shake like a little girl. He was stuffing blood hoses under my wig as I'm naked on this giant cr- cross. Music by Thurwell, play South of Your Border with Amelia Cudiero. And then Petra would have to wash me off with cold water. Theater had no hot water. So his job was the blood boy, to take the blood. And at the ninth night of 10 nights, I thought I had gotten pig's blood under the mucus in my eye. I went to the eyes, nose, ear, eye, and nose clinic, and they said, No, you just washed your eye too much. What are you doing bathing in pig's blood? <laughs> what are you doing bathing in pig's blood? I'm like, Hey, I'm a nurse. What do you think I just, that's the, you don't, don't want to know. That's my Pete Shore story. So I, I love Pete. I haven't seen him, in, it's been a while, but. Yeah, he always contacts me on our birthday, which is the same as the Marquis de Sade. So I mean, I have a special fondness for Pete Shore and the Unsane. So is the fe- is the fest on for twenty twenty two? 
I was thinking about it just recently and was just like, I don't think so. Just because one of the, one of the components I like doing is cranking out a bunch of releases with it. Right. Um, you know, like when we had the cows on one of those things, I was like doing some cows reissues and, uh, uh, like we did a, a special tenant on the last one that like Lydia was on and now with the pressing plants and everything else in life being, I mean, it's a, it's a nine to 10 month oh my lag. God. I, to it's get ridiculous. Stuff now. It, it's so ridiculous. It, and, and the quality control. I mean, I, I just feel like if you're, if, unless you're pumping out a million of these fucking things or whatever, a hundred thousand of them. Yeah. You just, yeah. You're on the back burner. You're not going to get the same treatment. It's just, Oh, yeah, the whole the whole thing is just ridiculous. Like everyone waited and then threw everything. I mean, it's like a whole slew of of reads creating the backlog, but then on top of it, throwing the shipping delays, and you're just like, fuck, it's endless. So that was that was one of the main reasons where I was like, you know, I, I don't I couldn't pull it off the way I'd like to, you know. So have you wait have you waited for some pressings, say eight to nine months, and the shit was all fucked up? <laughs> And then oh, you're God, like, then, yeah. then what? You have to wait another I, fucking eight or nine months? No, it's 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 insane. Like uh, that really took the wind out of my sails because that just started. And like I said, during COVID, we were turning shit around in 40 days. Like Buzz would send me the, t- the thing and we'd have it on people's hands within 40, 45 days. It was a fucking blast. Amazing. Amazing. You yeah. know, that, that, that was like, because doing it that way that like the art releases is, is to me, why I got back, I quit doing the label for years because I hated all the shit with it. I hated fucking dealing with college radio and promotions and the distributors and have that, that shit was never why I got into it. Obviously. Right, of course. Um, this way it's like, it's all about the art and music and we get done and we sell it and it's fucking gone and I'm done. And we, you know, move on to the next thing. It's all fun. It's fucking fun. You know, nine months lag. I've fucking lost interest. I'm, you know, I'm over there across the room, you know, and then luckily a couple, couple things came up with uh, working on a couple projects that would be more in depth and kind of out of the range. So it's like, okay, I found something to do for those nine months. You know, there was some, some, some people were going here in New York and I think in uh, Queens and even Brooklyn, there was some Jamaican kind of dance hall, little homemade, uh, you know, literally making these kind of records overnight for just for the clubs. And I mean, of so course, the, you know, I can arrange, sounds like you know, the no, Archer plant in Detroit that was around yeah. for years. It was like but, one press in a garage in this industrial kind of, neighborhood. In kind of. I mean, I mean, it wouldn't, I'm not advising that for your, for your, your company, but I'm just sometimes desperate, uh, desperate situations. Yeah, I mean, I've, require... I've been, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I mean, maybe it's, it's kind of the wrench you want to sometimes to shake it up. Cause it's like, it's getting comfortable, you know? Yeah, to me, look, to me, this time is no more desperate than any fucking time. It's just focused on another thing. I mean, it's like there's always the same level of desperation of of whatever rent hanging over your head, head of the possible poverty. I got to go answer the door. I'll be right back. I'm going to close this off. Tim, take it over. <laughs> oh, my God. So you're not, okay, so if you're not going to do the, the fest 2022. Maybe 2023. Maybe 2023. Okay. I gotta. I want to pull it out, do it again, but it's just like the. Uh, it's kind of one of those things where I literally we just kind of wing it. Just like, do we feel like doing it? You know, if the stars aligned, you know, right. it's like talking to one of the guys who's like, well, Dicroids and could, you know, there's so and so. If something comes up that you know presents itself, it's like let's let's do it. Fuck it. And it's kind of like it's kind of like having kids, where you got to okay. go long enough to forget all the bullshit and misery of the oh. crying and the two in the morning feeding and stuff. Yeah. After a little while, know. like the, you know, that dampens in your head and you're like, let's have another one. That's so fun. That, you know, oh that, my God. Yeah. I, I missed what you, I missed what you said, but let's have another one. That's so fun. I don't know if you were talking about a brain aneurysm or what you were talking about because I had to answer the door. I was talking about, about the stupidity of ha- repeatedly having kids where you go through the suffering. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, yeah, well, I have to edit you on that because there's a few things I don't like to talk about. Dogs, kids, marriage. I got wives. my pictures right here. Hold on, let me get the pictures. Yeah, you know what? I have the best <laughs> shot of your daughter and that's good enough for me. So I'm going to end with this. We are relentless. We are stubborn. We are jugglers. We are the Lydian spin with Tim Dahl and one of my favorite badasses that would be Tom Hazelmeyer. Thank you so much. Thank you for thinking of bringing you, me Tom. on. It's like yeah, a, cool. I always get like actually embarrassed when you, you're talking that way. It's just like, uh, somebody else here? Or would you? 
Uh, well, look, you like me, I can like you back, motherfucker. That's all I'm saying. All right. I got, I got your back. Talk to you Always. soon, Tom. Take care, my friend. Have a good okay. weekend. Thank you.